Hello everyone. In this video, I am picking up where I left off in a previous video about functions and relations. So in this video, I'll be going over tables, mapping diagrams, and sets of ordered pairs, as well as function equations. Let's get into it. In front of you, we see a set of ordered pairs. And with this set of ordered pairs, much like with graphs, you can tell whether or not this is a function right away by just looking to see if any x values repeat. And it looks like there's a repeating x value here with 4, so this is not a function. In addition to that, when you check the x values of all these ordered pairs, we can now write the domain for this set of ordered pairs because the set of all of the x values make up the domain. So the domain here, we have to list out the numbers because uh, that's all we're given. We don't have intervals here, just specific x values that follow the uh, set of ordered pairs. But you can do the same thing for the range as well. Just list out the numbers that are there in the y coordinates. And now you have the range. We can even evaluate this set of ordered pairs. Maybe I go back and I call this function g. So maybe I say, let's find g of 7. So normally, you know this is paired up uh, g of x equaling y. So it's just a fancy ordered pair. And what you can do then is just come up here to the set of ordered pairs and ask which y value is paired up with an x value of 7. Well, here's the x value of 7, boop, negative 3. And I can do things like x, so uh, g of x equals 12. And so now this is a y value. So what x value is paired up with a y value of 12? Well, there it is. It is an x value of 4. So here we would say x equals 4. Finally, uh, we don't have to worry about intercepts or anything like that with this. We've done everything that we need to know. Um, in the future, whichever course you're taking, you might see something like this. What is g of 0? And so you come up here and you're looking for an x value of 0, and you're going to tell me the y value paired up with it. 2, 7, 4, 11, 4. There is no x value of 0. What gives? This would be undefined, aka und, which is fine. Uh, that's because there's no ordered pair with an x value of 0. Finally, uh, Tables and mapping diagrams are just different ways to represent this information. So a table of this information might look something like this. And you can see uh, each row here, 2, 1, 7, negative 3, 4, 5, corresponds to an ordered pair in the set of ordered pairs. 2, 1, 7, negative 3, 4, 5, and so on. Now, the only other thing uh, here I need to talk about is a mapping diagram. So let me put the mapping diagram here. So this is how the mapping diagram starts. You have an X bubble with all the elements of the domain. No need to repeat the four. We just need to represent it one time. Same thing here. And all uh, Y bubble with all the elements of the range. Now, as it stands, there's nothing connecting these together, so you know where the ordered pairs are. How you connect them together is with arrows. So 2 is paired up with 1, 7 is paired up with negative 3, 4 is paired up with 5, 
11 is paired up with 9, and 4 is paired up with 12. Now one thing I did not mention here was, uh, for the table, it's easy to tell in the table whether or not is a function just like you did with the set of ordered pairs. You can just see here that the x value of 4 repeats just like we said up here. Now with a mapping diagram here, it's not as easy to tell just by looking at the numbers anyway, whether or not this is a function. The problem number is four for uh, x's here and four for the x's here. Now the only difference between this four and every other number is that this four has two arrows or more than one arrow coming from it. That is why, or that's how you can tell that this is not a function. Moving on to function equations. Function equations introduce this function notation, which I've talked about a little bit, but I want to uh, clear up just a little bit as to why it's important. So let's say you use the old way being y equals, y equals, y equals for all of these. And then I ask you, okay, what is the y value when x is four? and I don't name these equations something other than y equals y equals y, you're not going to know which answer I'm looking for. So as a way to lessen ambiguity, we give these functions specific names. Specifically here, f, g, and h. So the f function looks like this, g function, h function, and the variable that's in the parentheses here will tell you which variable is being used on the right side of the equation. That being said, I think the easiest place to start here is with domains. So this domain you're going to get for free. It is negative infinity to infinity, or if you like, you can use the symbol, the double bar R for all real numbers. Now this is all real numbers because there is no square root on a variable like this one, and there are no variables in a denominator like this one. And in fact, I wanna to move to this one next because if you've seen um, rational equations before, then you understand what the restricted value is and how to find that. Depending upon your teacher or professor, they say you'll take the denominator and set it to be equal to zero or maybe not equal to zero and solve to get x equals nine over two. So there's the restricted value. So that means any x value will work in this function except for this one, which means really it's all real numbers except nine over two. And this is how you would write that out in words, all real numbers except nine over two. But how do you write this out as an interval? Well, think about what all real numbers looks like, negative infinity to infinity. Those are actually gonna show up in our interval for this as well, but they're gonna be really, really separated out. So what's happening here is, the function is traveling along, traveling along, and then right here at nine over two, it gets really close, but you cannot include it. And then it just kind of hops over nine over two and gets as close as it can from the other side and keeps traveling along. So we'll uh, exclude nine over two from the left and nine over two from the right. But what ends up happening here then is now this creates two intervals for our domain. And anytime you have more than one interval trying to describe something, you can join them together with a union. Now, lastly, for the domain with this function, uh, you want to set what's inside the square root equal to zero and uh, sorry, greater than or equal to zero and then solve. 
So that means even if there was something out here like minus 15, the focus is what's on the inside of the square root. So we're just looking at this. And you pick this inside and set it to be bigger than or equal to zero because numbers have to be either bigger than or equal to zero inside of the square root. If we pick a negative number to be inside the square root, that gives us something imaginary, and there's no place to graph imaginary numbers on the x, y axis. So we say, yeah, this number, this inside, has to be equal to zero or bigger than that. So then you just go through and solve. So I'd subtract 12 from both sides, divide both sides by negative 3, and get x has to be less than or equal to 4. And uh, just to review, I leave the variables on the left because the inequality sign then shows me which direction the graph goes. So in my head, I'm picturing this 4, and I know it's equal to, so it's going to be a solid dot, closed dot, and it's going to go left forever, which is negative infinity. So negative infinity to 4 would be the domain here. Now there are ways to find out uh, the ranges of the functions, uh, but we don't go into that this early in mathematics. So just the domains for now, uh, these three functions will be used on the next slide uh, for function evaluation. All right, moving on with function evaluation, uh, you're given values of x, to substitute in for x. So if you see x in the f function gets replaced with 0, that means x everywhere else gets replaced with 0. So this would be 3 times 0 squared plus 7 times 0. And what this ends up simplifying down to is 0. 0 times anything is 0. 0 times anything is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. And we can do the same thing for f of negative 2. So this would be 3 times negative 2 squared plus 7 times negative 2. And I'll say here, I've just been doing it without saying it, anytime I make a substitution, I'm putting ver uh, parentheses around whatever is going in for the variable. So parentheses around the 2. Then you can just follow the order of operations here. 2, negative 2 to the second power is 4. 4 times 3 is 12. This whole first term is 12. 7 times negative 2 in the second term is negative 14. When you subtract these, you get negative 2. Not bad. What happens if you have a variable in parentheses? Well, same idea. Whatever is in getting substituted in for x in this case, you'll just substitute it in for x everywhere. So this would be 3 times p squared plus 7p. And what this does is ultimately just leave you with a variable switch. So this is 3p squared plus 7p. That's it. Lastly, we have f of 2 minus x. Now, what happens here? You just make that substitution again. So 2 minus x is being substituted in plus 7 times 2 minus x. And you can't just leave it like this. You have to actually square this 2 minus x and distribute the 3 here afterward and distribute the 7 here to get a final answer of 3x squared minus 19x plus 26. I will leave that simplification for you to complete. Now, we have a second function here. It is a square root function. And uh, it's the same idea. You can substitute 1 in for x. That's what happened here. So substitute 1 in for x here. Uh, that leaves you with a square root of 12 minus 3. 
I'm going to skip a step there. 1 times 3 is 3. 12 minus 3 is the square root of 9, which is 3. Nice. And the same thing can happen with the uh, g of negative 5. You can substitute negative 5 in here for x. Get 12 times negative uh, 12 minus 3 times negative 5, which is a positive 15 when you multiply that together. So this ends up being 12 plus 15 in a square root, which is the square root of 27, which simplifies to 3 square root of 3. So yes, you still have to know how to simplify square roots. And lastly, I want to change this one. This isn't going to be, uh, what is that called, 4x. We'll just call it uh, 2x. That's fine. Um, so we have g of 2x ends up being 12 minus 6x in a square root because you're just multiplying this input by 3 back here. All right. The last bit of example here with h of x, um, we have this rational function, and I'm asking to find h of 9 over 2, and hopefully that rings fresh in your mind from a few minutes ago. This is actually undefined because this is the restricted value we found on the last slide. Um, and I could go through uh, different inputs to have you simplify square root or simplify fractions and whatnot. Just know if you get a whole number input and you end up with 10 over 5, you have to simplify it to be 2. So just make sure you're always simplifying square roots and fractions. Uh, but I wanted to do this example here because it is um, it's a, it's pretty interesting. So when you have h of 2x over 7, essentially what you're doing is you're substituting 2x over 7 in for x in the original equation. So 5 times 2x over 7 all over 2 times 2x over 7 minus 9. And what this does is it creates fraction within a fraction. You can see it here, you can see it here, and that's just gross and ugly and no fun. The best way to eliminate fractions is to multiply by the LCD. In this case, the LCD of the input, the 7, the 7. These fractions are causing the problem. So off to the side, you can multiply the top and bottom by 7. And what that'll do is in the numerator, it'll reduce with this 7. But since the denominator has two terms, you have to multiply each term by 7. And yes, that will cancel this term, which is nice, or cancel this denominator, which is nice. And you're left with whatever's left over. So let's say 5 times 2x is a 10x in the numerator and in the denominator you have 2 times 2x is 4x and don't forget that this 7 distributes to each term so it's not 4x minus 9 it is 4x minus 63. Moving on to x and y intercepts, let me put that at the top here, x and y intercepts. Um, for x and y intercepts, what you need to remember is that whenever x is 0, you're finding the y intercept. So let's take a look at that real quick. Whenever x is 0, that will give you the y-intercept, so 3 times 0 plus, uh, squared plus 7 times 0. Oh, we found this on the last slide, huh? This just equaled 0. So the y-intercept is 0, comma 0. And to find the x-intercepts, the y-value is 0. Now, this is where it gets funky. This equation here 
to find the x-intercepts, we have to set f of x equal to 0. And you say, would we replace this whole thing? It's two different letters. No, 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 no. This is all one object. It Remember, it replaced the y. The entirety of this replaced y. So if we're going to substitute a number in for, quote, y, then this entire uh, expression should disappear for the 0. So look at that. Quadratic equations coming back. So how do you solve this? You can factor in x. Always look for common factors first. Then you can set each factor equal to 0. This one will give you x equals negative 7 over 3. And then you'll have your two x-intercepts of 0, 0, and negative 7 over 3, comma, 0. And yes, this does make good sense because look at that. There is a quadratic equation. There won't always be two x-intercepts, but I wanted to sort of keep it in line with what my students just learned about um, quadratic equations. Next, we do the same exact thing for g of x and h of x to find uh, intercepts. So first, to find the y-intercept, we set x equal to 0, 12 minus 3 times 0. Uh, so that just ends up being the square root of 12, which is really 2 square root of 3, which means the y-intercept is 0, 2 square root 3. Yep, you have to keep simplifying. All right, the x-intercepts in this case, how do we do that? Well, uh, we set y equal to 0. And again, this just took the place of y. So we can substitute 0 in for that entire expression, 12 minus 3x. And look at this, a square root equation. OK. So how does this work? 0 is our y-coordinate. In fact, I can come down here with the x-intercept and do this right away, 0. I know the y-coordinate has to be 0, because we just did that. There it is. Solve for x, square both sides. 0 equals 12 minus 3x. Solve for x and get x equals 4. Nice. There's the x-intercept. And the same thing can be done for this example. So go ahead and substitute 0 in for x. So h of uh, 0, 5 times 0 over 2 times 0 minus 9 gives you a 0 over 9, which is just 0. So the y-intercept here is 0 from the x-coordinate. We substitute it in, comma, 0 for the y-coordinate uh, that we figured out. Now, I, I didn't make a big deal of it over here, but if ever your x or y-intercept is 0, 0, I know automatically that the other will also be 0, 0. Now, that doesn't stop you from actually going through and finding the x-intercepts, because if I had just followed that here, I would have missed an x-intercept. So let's go uh, continue here. So the x-intercept I know is 0, 0. We have to see if there are any others. Substitute 0 in for y. 5x over 2x minus 9. But look at this, a rational equation. To solve a rational equation, you multiply by the LCD. The LCD here is just 2x minus 9. So when I multiply both sides by the LCD, it, this would cancel with the 2x minus 9 that we would multiply here. But on this side, 0 times 2x minus 9 would just be 0. 
So 0 equals 5x, which means x equals 0, and that's the only one we get, meaning the x-intercept here is 0, comma, 0. Last slide, thank goodness. Um, the last bit of information you need to know for function equations is how to tell whether or not it is a function. The easiest way for a college algebra course um, to know whether or not an equation is a function is the following. Does the equation have an absolute value of y or y to an even power? If the answer is yes, then it's not a function. If the answer is no, then it is a function. And that's really all there is to it. Another long video. I don't know if I can ever make short videos, but I appreciate you watching. Um, if you are watching this because you, <laughs> because I was absent for a day in class, I hope this all makes sense. Come to me next class with questions and I will get them all answered for you. Until then, have a good one.